Hello everybody, it's Stuart A. Swordlow. And Janet Diamoria Swordlow. And we are at the Kuiper Belt Conference here in St. Joseph, Michigan. And we have a lot of people here surrounding in the background and we have a little bit of news to give you today. Yeah, a little bit of news. We're going to catch up really fast. So if you hear some noise in the background, it's just everybody out there having fun. So I wish you were here, but since you're not, you know, you'll have to read about it in the newspaper, so to speak. So the first story we have is really fascinating because you know we were in Iceland this summer. We're, we're talking about Iceland somewhat this uh, weekend and we're also talking about Mars. So what does Iceland and Mars have to do together? That's a, good question. It's a very good question. Well, surprise, surprise, look what I found on the news. It says that there's a creeping lava flow in a stream of water which is used to mix and create hollow rough pillars that dot the Skylinger Valley in Iceland. Now, it's interesting because these types of features are never seen on land. They're only seen at mid-ocean ridges, usually uh -huh. about two miles underwater or three kilometers, according to uh, co-author Tracy Gregg, who's a geologist at the University of Bu at Buffalo in New York. Now, how did she find these pillars? Apparently, she was hiking in Iceland, and she came across some that are the tallest are eight feet high, which are 2.4 meters high and up to 3.3 feet or one meter wide. Now, local people say it was the trolls. The trolls put them there? The trolls put them there. You never trust a troll. Yeah, because they were tossing rocks and that's how they happened. However, she didn't buy that story, so she did more research about it and found out that these usually happen underwater. Now, so it goes on a little bit. But what's so interesting is at the end of this article, she says now that she has discovered how these pillars got in Iceland, how? because of, of these underwater ridges. They had to be water at some point. Well, that makes sense, because remember I told you Iceland has only been above water for about 12,000 years. Right. So that makes sense that these things formed underwater, and then when Iceland was thrust up at the end of the Atlantean period, left these things there. Right. So what now she is going to take these uh, the knowledge that she has about Iceland and these pillars, and she's going to look for high-resolution images on Mars uh -huh. for signs of similar lava pillars. Uh -huh. And this would be a sure sign that the Red Planet once had water. And this is going to be published in the Journal of Vol <laughs> Volcanology and Geothermal Research. So, as again, very interesting, Iceland and Mars. And this is how, again, they're imprinting you to know what's going on here on the planet. They're going to mm -hmm. extrapolate that to Mars. And it's interesting because a lot of places in Iceland look like Mars. They do. That, that's very Looks true. Like the surface of Mars. Absolutely. Well, now, moving forward, now there's another article, which, again, I found interesting, which is supporting alien life coming in from other places. Because apparently back in 2001, why they're bringing that out now, apparently they've been studying this rain that fell in the Indian state of Kerala. At that particular time, it was drenched, it says, by bizarre red-colored like rain, never seen before anywhere else. And they're going to be filming... Uh, or they know where it came from. Well, this is the issue. Apparently, Godfrey Lewis, and that was the name God, Godfrey, Lewis is a physicist based in Kerala who has analyzed these drops of rain because they're expecting the strange color would be dust particles. Okay, like from volcanoes or, or something. something. But it didn't turn out to be that way because they were, tra they were irregular shape, they're not transparent, and like that these are, volcanic dust is that way. So anyway, they kept analyzing it and noticed that they were not blood cells because that was something else that he thought it might be. Well, looking under the microscope, it seems the particles appeared to be alive with superficial similarities to blood cells, but not blood cells. Um, let's see. So, the Center for Earth Science Studies attributed the red rain to an exploding meteor, because that's what they do first off, but this guy didn't buy that story. So he has been working through it, and what he found in a lab in Sri Lanka was extremely shocking, because there were... Um, uh, let's see. Spore cells. They were spore cells, but were replicating, but not a trace of DNA. So therefore, he believes that the spores were on the meteor that exploded over Kerala prior to the rainstorm. But was there a meteor that exploded, or are they just putting well, in a story? They're to just putting fix in it. the story to fix it. Fill in the blanks. Yes, and then we had another gentleman named Chandra, and I'm going to let you read that name because I can't say it. What if I say it really wrong? Vikram Sangha announced he found tiny fossils inside a meteorite in Sri Lanka in December of this mm -hmm. last year. And he's using this to promote the theory of panspermia, panspermia, which says a theory that says life exists throughout the universe and distributed by meteoroids and asteroids. 
So again, they're continuing to promote this theory that life comes from somewhere else. So continue to uh, notice all these stories that are coming out on the news. I have a couple other stories. You know, I like to bring a few things that are a little stranger interesting, obviously. So I'm going to go ahead and share a couple with you. There was a man who killed a daughter's boyfriend in Pennsylvania because they broke up. Now, these days, the killing of somebody is like, you know, happens every day. Especially and, uh, in Pennsylvania. Yeah. And we have people here from Pennsylvania. But remember what I have told you, that after a while you get numb and it's not really news. So the interesting thing to me about this whole story was that the aunt of the man who was killed says, who would ever remove parts of the body? It's one thing to get angry and kill someone, like that's just okay, but to dismember him is as low as you can get. So they've taken it now, so killing somebody, you know, we can accept that, but the fact that you destroyed the body. So think about where we're going with our morals. So if you kill someone, don't cut them up, just leave them in I guess, and, and that's, that's how okay. we can understand. That's mm -hmm. kind of, to me, the yeah. purpose of this whole story. Yeah. Okay, the next story I think was very interesting as well yeah. because we have a story of euthanasia in uh, Belgium. Now, Belgium is actually the second country in the world to legalize euthanasia. Do you know the first one? Switzerland. Nope. You're Switzerland close. does euthanasia. Uh, Netherlands. Netherlands uh. was the first, and now Belgium, they said. So what's interesting to me, apparently the death by euthanasia has increased by 25% in the last year. And they also have a, a bill before Belgium at Parliament to allow people under 18 to consent to euthanasia. That's brilliant. Because they're not going out... Because they're old enough to know that that's what they need to well, do. Well, this is my point, because the latest person to die by euthanasia, that at least they're doing, saying publicly, is a transsexual. It was a female uh, who was, in her mind, was a male, went through the surgery to become a male, the surgery was botched, and so he didn't want to live anymore. So only 44 years old, they did agree to kill him. They agreed to kill him by euthanasia. So this is one thing that I've been telling people: there are some people who are legitimately born transsexual, and there are those who, because of all the programming that's going on, are just walking through the program. And these are the people that are going to be unhappy with the results, because if you really are transsexual, you are going to. You know, it may be a rough ride, but you're going to take that ride. And this person at 44. Now, interestingly enough... I think they should euthanize a doctor that did it. Well, it, I just think it's such a... And, you know, like I said, they're not coming to kill the people. People are signing up to be killed. So keep yes. this in mind. They also talked in the article about a 44-year-old woman with anorexia was euthanized. They agreed to that. A 65-year-old woman with chronic depression, they agreed to euthanize her. So in they my... They kill a lot of people on this planet. That's right, and all they have to do is bombard the specific frequency, and people are going to be lining up to have this mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. So... And that was in... Uh, this was in Belgium. In Belgium, and they have such great chocolate. All you just... Just get some chocolate, and you will You'll feel better. That. Yeah. That's right, you'll feel better. Just mm -hmm. go to a Belgium chocolate store, yeah. people, please. No more euthanasia. Yeah. Okay, now I've also, as you know, talked a lot about eating insects. And I told you that the insects um, would be fed to poor people because it's a cheap crop. And I here we have. They're going to cake, not grass. Well, they're going to turn them into cake. Oh. They're going to take them, they're going to raise them, they're going to wash them, they're going to dry them, and then they're going to grind them into flour. Oh, yummy. And apparently they have about a million dollars or ten tons worth of insects which will be delivered to Mexico by March. Delivered to Mexico? Because so Mexico well, doesn't have enough that's bugs. What, that's what the article says. So I want you to be aware of exactly what I said is coming down the pike. And I have another interesting story. I've got two well, or three left. I know, we've got special guests coming along. So I want to tell you about dinosaur sex. Or actually, more specifically, dinosaur erotica. There is such a thing. There is now such a thing. Dinosaur erotica. Well, I have two women. Does that mean there's a, like, horn we have song? To move, we have to move this along, remember? Because i got stories okay. that, are, that are really we'll fascinating here. Okay? So it says that women like the idea of men of the male dinosaurs having rough sex with them. I imagine it'd be rough. I imagine it would be rough. Usually it's with a smaller female. It says all the spikes and everything. Uh, I don't know, but anyway, it's just it, it, the the article is really rather graphic, and the two supposedly women writing this story they're doing it under a pen name, so we don't really know who's writing the story. 
but apparently they're claiming it's just amazing. 60% of their readers are men, 40% are women, and they're between the ages of 21 and 65. So watch for more people to have sex with dinosaurs, which reminds me of the reptilians that are coming. Of course, you're going to want to interbreed, right, I guess? And then they're also going to be doing more stories with female humans and well right now they're doing female humans and male dinosaurs they're going to change it so they have I guess female dinosaurs and male humans and also same-sex pairings because I have to stay up to date so dinosaur erotica people put that on your book list that's a new one on me okay then along that same line on the Facebook pages they were posting it just when we think it can't get any worse or more blatant I guess a mm -hmm. t-shirt of a um, female labia and it's showing that woman masturbating while she's menstruating. This is now a new thing. And People want to see that. But, you know, on a t-shirt? I mean, it's just, like I said, it just gets more and more mainstream, which okay. is what we're... These people need to get a hobby. Uh, yeah, well, apparently they have one. Well, that's the hobby. <laughs> that's the <a> hobby. <laughs> okay, so last story, which is I also think is a, a good trigger for the time that's going on. Good in quotes, of course. It says that the Vatican just put out 6,000 gold, silver, and bronze medals yeah. to commemorate Pope Francis. Now, they've misnamed, they've misspelled Jesus. Yeah, yeah, can you that? believe that? Mm -hmm. I don't think that can happen. They spell, instead of Jesus, it's L-E-S-U-S. Lesus. Lesus. What does that mean? Well, it does be you tie your shoe lesus. Well, lesus, it could be under. S-U-S is not under in some language. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But anyway, so apparently um, some of the medals were actually sold by the, they were made by the Italian state mint. They were sold. So if you have actually purchased one, then they said that it's going to be worth a lot of money. They have to recall those. Yeah. But somehow or another, there's got to be a trigger in here because nobody's going to misspell the name of Jesus, right? Yeah, really? Especially the Vatican. So yeah. that's well, what I've got. Well, that was pretty interesting Short stuff. and sweet, but yeah, of course, it's always yeah. fascinating. I find the mm -hmm. most strangest stories, you know that. I, yeah, I don't know where you go, but you find I them. I find the stories. Or people send them to me, so keep sending them in, post them yeah. on my Facebook page. We'll but we got to run. We have to run because we why? Tell a special guest, Simon Parks, is going to be live in it. Well, not in well, person, but on screen. On Skype. And who right is now, Simon Parks? Not everybody Donna knows. He's a British politician who has interaction with the Mantids, which we're going to connect to the Kuiper Belt. So sorry if you're not here to see it. Fascinating info. Should have been here. I wore green because isn't mantids green? Some of them are. Oh, you got green. I, li I like the white mantids though. White mantids? Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. well, okay. Anyway, see you next time. Bye. Bye.